que eu vou. Hey. Hi, can you hear us clearly? I think she's on her commute home, but she can hear us. She just said, Thurgood. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, y'all, so the meeting is now live on Facebook and streaming. It did send a notification possibly to all of you letting me know that it's being streamed and also the recording as well. I'll be letting the folks in at 6.30 on the dot, but of course, if you need more time, feel free to let me know. Um, Maybe since there's not very many people, can we just give it like an extra like, I guess you could let people in, but then just like maybe give them like, give it like five minutes before you actually like start, I think. Sure. Then, you know, just in case people are joining like a little bit late, I want to, um, you know, do the introductions a little bit later. Yeah, sounds good. We'll start at like 6.35. I'll let them know once you let them in. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, we're going to give it another few minutes before we get started, um, just for other folks to join. We'll get started about 6.35. Thanks everyone.
All right, everyone, uh, let's get started. Um, I'm gonna be the moderator today. My name is Priyam. Um, I'm a member of South Queens Women's March. Um, I myself am an attorney at a nonprofit. I'll actually be participating in tomorrow's panel. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna turn it over to um, our panelists today to introduce themselves. Um, and I am going to start with uh, Nicole. Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. So hi everyone, my name is Nicole Cobham. I am a manager at KPMG where I serve banking capital markets clients and financial services, risk management and compliance. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then Rose, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, sure. Hi everyone, my name is Rose Danarine. I am a full-time real estate agent, a radio host and a professional MC. But today I'm being interviewed as a real estate agent. <laughs> okay, um, and then George, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey everyone, I'm George, uh, CFO at Clarity Insurance Agency. I'm responsible for accounting, finance, legal, and risk. Thanks. Hi, uh, Jennifer, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Jen Persaud, and I'm an enterprise customer success manager at Iterable, um, which is a marketing technology company. Okay, great. And last but not least, Ayola, would you like to introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. My name is Ayola. I am a senior manager at Proactivity, uh, mostly focusing on IT audits. Uh, I own a real estate investment company, and um, I also own a financial literacy company as well. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, so I'm going to probably ask questions in the same order. And anybody who is here, if you have a question, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, BB is going to be helping to co-moderate, and this is being streamed on Facebook. Uh, so she will let me know if there are any questions in that chat as well. Um, so yeah, let's get started with Nicole. Uh, so what inspired you to pursue a career um, in your sector? Yeah, so in college I studied finance um, as well as law and just I initially had an interest in to get into the legal field, but got the opportunity to work with um, EY, which is in consulting, got into financial crimes and um, always love the investigative side of finance and kind of figuring out, you know, where it can go wrong, how I can help. So that really kind of married the the passion that I had in the law side of it with the financial side, which I was good in in college. So just kind of found a career that made sense for me and I've been doing it for the last five years and I'm enjoying it a lot. Okay. Uh, how about you, Rose? Yeah, sure. So back in 2001, I was an admin in a real estate company and being behind a desk, but being able to observe real estate agents working on the field made me fall in love entirely with real estate. So real estate offers a dynamic nature and the opportunity it gives to families being able to own a home it is the reason I pursued the career because it's the satisfaction. And also it gives me market knowledge and helps me to implement the negotiation skills that I've always loved doing, so. Okay, um, and how about you, George? Uh, so I fell into the insurance space by accident and anyone that tells you otherwise is lying. <laughs> um, it was during business school. Um, my passion is actually in general management uh, of businesses. Um, so during business school, um, a, a buddy of mine shared his vision of wanting to uh, go from the captive insurance side to the independent insurance side. Um, and you know, I he, he sold that vision to me. I shared it with him. And uh, since then, we've built up uh, our franchise. Uh, now we are in about 36 states. So that's that. <laughs> Great. Um, how about you, Jen? Sure. So my field is a little newer. Um, so I'm in startup world marketing technology. Um, all of those buzzwords that come along with it. Um, so similar to George, I fell into this. 
Um, now anyone who tells you otherwise is probably saying the truth, but, but back when I started about 10 years ago, um, it was very new. And so I just happened to be, um, I started off on the marketing side of the house and then customer success, um, which is the client facing role in, in technology companies, um, started to become more and more, uh, prominent. And so that's how I just ended up in that space. All right, thank you. And Ayola. Yes, uh, I got into real estate. It's actually a family, um, a family business. My dad was in real estate uh, back home in Africa, and and now he's retired and he owned many properties. And off the rental incomes, he was able to survive. Well, kind of plan out his retirement. And from there, that led me to invest in real estate. And I really love the idea of retiring early. Uh, so that's everybody else. Um, as for the financial literacy part, I think the first time that happened was I, I helped one of my friends with their finances, with budgeting. Um, and then the individual suggested starting a business in it because everybody uh, really need finance and budgeting advice, you know, especially because it's not taught in college or even high school. So um, that led me to starting that business as well. Okay, great. All right. Um, so I guess we can go in the same order. Maybe we'll switch it up at some point. But uh, can you share uh, your educational background and how that prepared you for your career path? Uh, Nicole? Yes. So um, I studied finance, but I will say in consulting, it's not necessarily as long you typically can any field, any sector that you want to get into, but study finance and biology with the minor in like legal studies. Um, and it kind of from there now progressing my career, it's more about certifications and experience. So my niche is more like fraud and financial crimes. So I've just continued to refine my education in that space. Okay, uh, Rose? Sure. So I studied liberal arts with a concentration in English. And I think more so the experience I had behind the desk, uh, 10 years worth of experience allowed me to work with clients and that has helped me throughout my, my career. All right, and uh, how about you, George? Uh, I have a, uh, I studied economics uh, for my undergrad and I studied finance for my MBA. Um, neither of which had anything to do to do with consulting at first. Um, but I learned that the MBA would prove extremely versatile in um entre entrepreneurship and the different aspects of uh building and managing a business. Okay. Um, and Jen? Yeah. I am similar to Nicole, one of the very few people that actually studied marketing in college. I think there's like five to 10% of us that actually did that and ended up in the field. Um, and I did a master's in international business, but I think that that being one of the few that has the marketing background and worked in marketing a little bit has definitely helped them um, prepare me for, for knowing the client side of things. Um, but it's definitely all, none of my colleagues studied marketing in college. So it's a matter of prerequisite for sure. Okay, thank you. And Aola? Yes, so I actually got my MBA in cybersecurity, uh, which is totally different from real estate. But um, being in the MBA program, you actually learn the tools and resources to help you start a business, uh, accounting, finance, and all those uh, little, little details. So that kind of prepared me for the path I'm in right now. Um, as for real estate and Find in the finance piece, I kind of learned that from my parents. So that's really interesting. I feel like um, <laughs> all of you have had different, you know, their educational backgrounds aren't necessarily all, you know, related, or it wasn't like a direct path from school into your field. That's that's really interesting because you know, as a lawyer, right, it's a little bit more. You can't be a lawyer without going to law school. Well, you can, but it's it's very 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 rare. All right. Um, so what was your first job in the field and how did it contribute to your professional development? Uh, I think I'm just going to go in the opposite order. Um, so, Aola, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, I started my career at PricewaterhouseCoopers, so same as Nicole, Big Four. 
uh, for me, it, it, it really helped me professionally, especially developing the skill, the skills I needed in my current field, which is IT, but it also made me more hungry to understand that I don't want to work forever till I'm 65 to actually retire. I actually want to retire earlier than that. And that was a huge motivator uh, for me. Uh, because again, once you start moving up the level, you realize, you know, how much the companies charge, um, especially for your talent. And and then from there, you, re you, you realize that you can implement the same thing if you want the same type of company or even something better. So that's what motivated me uh, from, uh, from starting the PwC. Okay, and Jen? Yeah. So my first job in this field, as I mentioned, was kind of, it was at a 20 person startup company, um, where as someone on the marketing team, you did everything possible under the sun because there's only 20 people at the company. And so that was, as I alluded to before, that's kind of how I ended up in this field. They needed someone client facing. I raised my hand. It felt like a good opportunity to, to kind of hone in on communication skills. Um, and so I think just having, having that opportunity early in my career to try something new, um, was really what helped me again, just try it out and see if it was something that I liked. And then it ended up being my, my career for the past 10 years. Great. Thank you so much. And George? Uh, my first job, uh, was at Deloitte Consulting, um, and my biggest takeaway was being able to think through and structure a problem and being able to deliver it clearly and concisely. Um, and it's contributed to the analytical skill and the problem solving skills as long as long as with uh, collaborating with a large team. Thank you. Uh, Rose? Sure. So at my first job, I worked at a company called Remax and being able to work with over 60 agents and also being there for about five years connected me to other agents. So when I left after five years, I've had about 100 agents under my contact list and in my network. And it was a, I was able to use that in the future, becoming a real estate agent. And it just made life simpler, knowing the agents in the past, reaching out to them, asking them for appointments uh, to show their listing. They already knew who I was. That was a, I was able to connect, but also at the same time, being a receptionist, working with them, I was polite. So I was, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing if I was rude, they would have not want to help me out when I was an actual agent. So not just the experience dealing with buyers and sellers behind a desk, but also building relationship, which was so important in any, any sort of field you're in. So, and I'm still friends with most of them today and that it, it goes a long way. Thank you. Uh, Nicole? Yeah, and similar to uh, George and Iola, I started in Big Four as well at EY, which now I work with a direct competitor of them. Um, but from my start there, uh, I would say similar to them is the problem solving skills. Um, you know, as consultants, they come to us with whether there was an issue or there's something that they need to help get fixed. Um, and we're here to ultimately, you know, work together to build whether it's a new solution, help remediate something. So just the problem solving skills, communication skills, and being comfortable with speaking with, you know, whether it's people at a government regulator, you know, a top exec at a bank, like just, you know, having that confidence to be able to communicate and articulate yourself and um, kind of help, you know, resolve their needs. Thank you so much. Oh, I guess, sorry. I thought I was on mute, but I wasn't. I, you know, you would think that after working remotely, at least part-time for years, I would be, you know, sure if I was muted or not, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, all right. So could you describe a particularly challenging moment in your career and how you overcame it? And um, I guess we'll go in the same order. So go ahead, Ayola. 
uh, professionally or business wise? Um, well, actually, I'm kind of curious, like, how do you define the, like, uh, it could be professionally or business wise, but I'm not really sure how you define, so I would consider business a profession, right? But, um, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess the first example for me, um, will be currently uh, being in consulting, we have to communi communicate tough results to executives. Um, and a lot of times it's not, you don't always get the right feedback or the right response. So dealing with that, especially when it comes to issues um, that could eventually affect somebody's bonus or payout, uh, can lead to, you know, individuals responding a certain way. So um, what kind of helped me was we had uh, training that actually prepared us for these kind of situations that help you manage, you know, different people of, um, of different attitudes and exactly how to get your point across. So for me, especially when dealing with an executive, um, it was really, really important for them to show, for me to show them the details, exactly how we got to our analysis and exactly how the team came up with uh, the results. Um, eventually it led to the executive and their team adding uh, budgeting up to $200,000 for the issue. Um, and of course, nobody wants to spend that amount of money to fix, you know, uh, a concern, but eventually it led to good results because when the regulators came in um, to review the infrastructure and how the systems are, it led to a great result, and they passed uh, the and they passed the audit. So um, that was one example that happened to me on the real estate side. I think the hardest thing for me was deciding to start. Uh, especially right now with, with, with interest rates. Uh, but I'm glad that I have a mentor and my mentor was told me to marry the asset and date the rate. So you can always, if you find a, a asset or a property that you really, really like, you know, buy it, um, make sure you do all your numbers and crunch out everything you need to do. And for the rate, uh, in a year or two, you can always refinance and get a lower rate and decrease your uh, your interest rate. And sometimes you can even buy down points even decrease the interest rate. So uh, those would be the two examples for me. Yeah. And now, and now I kind of understand what you meant by the distinction, but yeah, I mean, either would have been great, but I'm, I'm glad you gave us a more extensive answer. It's always appreciated. Um, all right. Uh, Jen. Yeah. Um, so I think it probably makes sense to take a step back and say what I do because it's not very clear. Um, so um, marketing technology is, is kind of a, a newer space. So the companies that I have historically worked for, um, all of you are very familiar with. We power things both on the website and email. So if you've ever gotten a pop-up on a website that says enter your email for 10% off, um, if you see anything following you around that website that's urging you to buy, if you get an email that says you left this in your cart, um, and then any of the marketing emails that, that you get really, or reset your password emails, all of that, um, the companies that I have worked for and continue to work for, that's what we, what the technology powers. Um, so one of the most trying times in my career was in a previous role, I had taken over 1-800-Flowers as one of our enterprise clients. Um, they were not happy, had not implemented our technology after a year of paying us. Um, and so I was handed this dumpster fire of a, of a client in a way. Um, and luckily their offices are right on, on Long Island. So I was able, but had to sit, I am, it's hard to tell on Zoom, but I am a four foot 10 brown woman. So me having to go in to an office of 15, um, executives that included the one Andrew Flowers CMO and explained to them why they should continue to use us, why they should renew, um, why they should actually start using us uh, was a pivotal moment and challenging, but it was 
one that I look back at, this happened five or six years ago. And it's one that I constantly look back at because I think the biggest thing that I learned from that was that I think we get really bogged down with, with executives sometimes, um, especially if you're younger or you're you're just not a VP, you're not a CMO, you're not one of those. And so I think just going in there and understanding and realizing that they're human and not trying to sell the moon when we know that we need to start at foundational things and just get them to buy in at the ground level. And then once you build that foundation, you build that relationship, then you can add on the ancillary things later on. Um, but I think um, as Rose had mentioned before, kind of building that network and, and building that relationship was the, the important part of that. Um, and especially in any client facing role, I feel like that's kind of at the forefront. Um, and it's sometimes not as easy to be friends with all of them. Um, so just kind of learning to manage different personalities and also understanding that some people like small talk, some people just want to get down to, to business. Um, all of that kind of culminated in that, in that experience and they did renew and they paid us more money. So it, it ended up being good in the end. George. Uh, so as CFO, one of my main jobs is to drive growth of the company. And one of the ways that we grow is in organic growth, specifically in merger and acquisition activity. Um, so I write a lot of buy sell contracts. I write a lot of I write a lot, I edit a lot, I revise a lot of buy sell contracts. And one of my very first uh deals, transactions, um, I was confused between an asset purchase or an entity purchase. And I accidentally wrote out a asset purchase contract rather than a entity purchase contract. Um, it was completely wrong. Had no idea what uh, what to do. Uh, sure. Sorry to interrupt, but I actually have no idea what the difference between those two things are. And I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> so do you mind clarifying a little bit? Yeah. So so um, an asset purchase is like you buy a specific division of a company. Right. So if a company has divisions A, B, and C, and you only want to buy division A, then it's an asset purchase. Uh, you don't you, you don't buy out the corporate structure, you don't buy the names or the trademarks or the EIN, um, just what the revenue and assets of that specific division is. Whereas an entity purchase, you buy out the entire company that has all three divisions and you buy the name and the federal employer tax ID number and any trademarks and any IP that, that is associated with it. Um, so I did the wrong thing because we were actually buying the entity, which included the federal tax ID, which is important and in, trans in a transaction. Um, didn't know what to do. Uh, so I dug back into, um, my contract law classes, um, where I had notes, uh, about writers and, uh, amendments and, uh, endorsements. Um, so I pulled a template from like one of the real old school classes and, 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 and I use it, I got a sign, got it notarized. Um, so I always tell um, younger students at my school is, you know, always keep your uh, school notes, you know, like sure, like you might've graduated and you might never look back at it ever again, but I have multiple times and I'm sure, you know, you will as well. Um, but I'm a big trial by fire guy. So, you know, it's like, if you don't swim, you sink. <laughs> but that was my experience. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rose? Yes, sure. So as you all know, I work with a lot of buyers and sellers and there is a thing called buyer's remorse. Sometimes buyers do get nervous and they may want to pull out of a deal. And that happened over the summertime. And I've been working with this family and we went ahead and went to the step of just getting an offer accepted, paid for the inspection that was done and then they decided to not go ahead with the property. Now I know working with this family, this was the house for them, but how do I let them know this is the house for them without being aggressive, being pushy. I wanted them to, to come to their own realization, this is the home for you. We went ahead, reviewed other properties and the father kept thinking about that home. 
I said to the family, you don't have to pay any sort of money to go see this house again that you originally fell in love with. Let's go take a look. So we did go take a look and they bought like 20 other family members and they did re-fall in love with the house again. And without being the person who said, well, you have to buy this house because that's not how I want to come across. But I usually sit down and do a buyer's consultation before taking out a buyer. So we spend about an hour. I get to know exactly what they're looking for. So I knew this was something they would have loved and be happy in. But it was their choice as well to look at other homes. Ultimately, they did purchase the home. And now they spend a lot of time in the backyard. I saw them about two months ago. They love it. They're so happy there. And I was able to sell another family member up there who came that day a home. And one of the things she mentioned, one of the buyers said, Rose is not pushy. She lets you make the decision. However, I was able to get them to purchase the home without, without aggression. But it's ultimately, it felt like it was their decision but I knew where I was placing them and their mind and it worked out. So again, having that skill and ability to connect with people is very important. And it still happens as um, one of the guest panelists mentioned, interest rates are high and buyers are having a lot of uh, decisions to make, but we don't marry the rate as you mentioned. So there's a lot of challenges, but homeownership, it is a great investment and I'm happy to be a part and impact families. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Nicole. Yeah, so a challenge that came to mind is um, I just actually wrapped up um, a bank acquisition this year. So just combining two banks and, you know, just the process of two different cultures of different companies coming together can always cause a uh, little, you know, turmoil at times. So just dealing with, you know, people, you know, if there's one role and there's two people like kind of exiting those, um, you know, potential, those previously employees coming together, making sure that everything comes through together smoothly and just working with so many key stakeholders from all across the world. It caused a lot of challenges. And, and the role that I had, I was a program manager, kind of oversight for all of those project plans and just making sure everything came through. Um, and ultimately, we finally got through it this um, Memorial Day weekend. It was a lot of work over the course of the like, almost two years, but um, it was something that I've learned a lot about just interacting with multiple different clients from all across the world and just really making a big impact on, you know, in the financial markets here. So it was just something challenging, but definitely rewarding. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, switch up the questions a little bit because I just think this one piggybacks off well. So you talked about a challenge just now. Um, can you share a memorable achievement or project from your career that you are particularly proud of? Um, I'm gonna go in the same order for now. Uh, so go ahead, Aola. It can yeah. be any aspect of your career. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll stick to real estate for now. Um, so, we just recently closed on a four unit and it took took a year. Um, so we were investing in Cincinnati, Ohio uh, and we're based in Jersey. So it's so long distance managing the property alone was, was, was difficult. Uh, we had issues with contractors, trusting contractors to do the right job, especially when they know you're not in that state. Uh, they would say things are done, but they're not done. Um, the property got vandalized. Uh, then we had to put in a claim, insurance claim. Um, it, it was a, it, it was a lot of. It, it was just a big, I would say a big mess. But overall, um, the the once we finished the renovation, we were able to have a huge lump sum of a cash refinance because we had a uh, we had a hard money loan which is basically a renovation loan uh, for it. so we started from the property had nothing in there we built it up put cabinets fridge everything and then the property appraised we bought it for two hundred and 
240 and then it appraised for like 500k um uh, and it was be it was just an amazing deal and then on top of that the the units cover all our utility utilities and we're making um i would say over a thousand dollars in uh res net income after all the expenses was paid for so that even though all that hard work was there, even with the high interest rates right now too, um, we were still able to accomplish that. So I always tell people, um, just like Rose is saying, uh, invest in real estate whenever you can. Thank you. Um, and Jennifer? Yeah. Um, so the achievement that I that first came to mind is actually not in my current uh, role, but in my my first company where I mentioned that I started off in the marketing team and then um, got the opportunity to move over to to customer success and be client facing. Um, I was part of a small team that while I was on the marketing team, we rebranded the entire company. And that was a real moment in quite a few months, I think it was like a six month project where there were six of us who were tasked with coming up with new logo and painting the office and what are the colors going to be and all of the things. Um, but thinking about brand in general, and I think that's why marketing has always been really interesting to me is just, it's not what, just what people see, but it's the emotions that people feel when they, when they do see the logo or when they think of a company name. Um, so there was a lot, we did a lot of interviews with clients and did, um, and with employees and tried to understand and came up with new core values and what does this mean and what do we stand for as a company? Um, and there were really long days. Again, we were the ones that actually physically painted the office and did all of the things. And we did a whole reveal, um, at a, at a huge hotel in New York. And it was just a really cool project that I don't think many people get an experience because how many time are, times are companies really rebranding um so just being able to to be a part of of something that I don't think I would ever get the chance to do again in my career um was a, a cool highlight and something to look back on thanks um George so uh, one of my biggest uh, achievements, uh, achievements recently was being able to negotiate the valuation of a uh, of an asset purchase significantly lower by, by around 50%. Um, you know, we were trying to figure out why the seller was playing hardball. Um, you know, we, we, we've made our points um, and there was no way we were accepting a two and a half times trailing 12 months valuation on that purchase. Um, so I've realized that negotiations were, wasn't exactly about making concessions or, you know, playing hardball or driving a needle through their head. It was about really figuring out what they wanted emotionally um, kind of like John mentioned, like once they see something emotionally, it might hit hard, uh, harder, um, a bit more. Um, so what did he want? He really wanted to take his kid to see a Knicks game at Madison Square Garden. So we got him tickets, um, and we took him out, got, got him dinner, got him and his kid some souvenirs, and uh, he folded on that valuation on the, the um on the asset purchase. Um, it came down by 50%. Um, and that was a great, uh, that was a great feeling, right? Because if you keep, continue to drive the price down, that's better for your own margins. Um, was a, was a price fair? Yes, it was favorable to me. Um, but it's business and, you know, doggy dog. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, uh, one of my most recent, uh, achievements, so yeah, negotiate with uh, emotions. Thank you. <laughs> all right, I, I really like that answer. <laughs> um, all right, um, and Rose, uh, it's your turn. Okay, sure. So I worked with a couple recently and I remember at the closing table, the attorney on the other side mentioned that particular investor 
had four other deals and it started before our transaction, but mine was the one that closed first. So the attorney who was representing us, who's part of my team mentioned, it's Rose's magic. Her name is Tamara Barakat. She said it's Rose's magic, but I don't see it as Rose's magic because I have this team that I surround myself with, the attorney, the right lender, and an inspector who the buyers all used uh, my referral, they were able to, to get to the closing table faster. Yes, I did mention to the listing agent, if we offer a certain number, can you not have an open house? What is the number that would not, that would avoid you having an open house? And they accepted an offer at the open house because maybe you all might be aware, but there is bidding wars going on, low inventory, and we did not want to go to open house. But I would also say it was because of the team that I surrounded myself with and my clients used. It is why our transaction closed before the four other deals that started before. So it was a great feeling hearing that from the other attorney and my clients was able to get into the home much sooner. They were happier. And it is because deals are very challenging. We have obstacles and this is one of the reasons why I am in real estate because I'm so passionate about making a great impact, a positive impact on people's lives. And it was definitely rewarding to hear that. And I still have the same team that I work with, the lender, the inspector, and the attorney, and they're great. And I think having a team, the right people on the team helps. Thank you so much, Rose. And I apologize for this horrible lighting. I'm just, I, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, Nicole, go ahead. Yeah, so I would say a recent accomplishment. Um, actually, just got promoted uh, last month. So, just uh, a lot of last five years, a lot of work, and a lot of people have given me opportunities to kind of develop myself and showcase my skills. And now, being a part of the management group, it's just exciting, and I'm excited for the next journey in this career. But um, yeah, that's my most recent accomplishment. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations, Nicole. Um, okay, so we have a question. Um, I am going to kind of just leave this to whoever would like to answer this question. Um, but can you talk a little bit about um, negotiating skills to close a deal? I know George at least was talking about closing a deal. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure if that's relevant to everybody's career. So just, you know, answer um, if you'd like to. Um, and you know, whoever wants to start can start. I'm happy to start. I uh, So a big part of my role is not just helping clients use our platform and strategizing with them from a marketing perspective, but upselling and renewing them. So everyone says, customer, everyone in customer success doesn't wanna be labeled as sales, but in a way we are. Um, and so, I think a big part of it does come back to what George was saying and, and everything that, that I've heard is just, and what I've experienced is you really do have to get to know the people that you're working with. People buy from people that they like. That's kind of the crux of it. And so if you are chasing the wrong thing or if you're you're trying to shove something down someone's throat that is not what they want and not what they're looking for, you're one your credibility is going to go out the door with them. And two, because they're not going to feel heard and they're not going to feel seen. And then they're not going to work with you in the future. Um, and then two, you're from, from your perspective, you're ultimately not going to get that deal closed. So what I have found is that it comes down to building that relationship, but also really understanding what the person needs. And then kind of what Rose was saying too, I think, letting them feel like it's their idea and leading them to to that um is always a good tactic that works is starting with starting with what you want to get out of something and then kind of backing into that to see how that what that trajectory looks like um to get to that end result because i it, it always when someone feels like 
oh yes, I do need this thing because of X, Y, and Z. And they kind of come to that on their own or they think that they do, then that's where it's much more impactful. They'll go to their boss and they'll get the budget for it and they'll, they'll do what they need to do if they feel like it's their idea um, and they have skin in the game. So that's what I found. Yeah, that, no, that's some good stuff. Um... You know, I was going to say, I'm going to have to charge you for this advice, but I realize this is a nonprofit. Um, you know, just to piggyback off what Jen said, you know, great stuff. Um, you know, definitely get to know who you are working with, uh, understand their needs and their wants, uh, you know, understand the emotional aspect behind it. But when you're framing things, and, 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 and this is truly one of those important parts about negotiating, when... When you're trying to deliver your message, you want to frame it to the benefit of who you're delivering it to, right? What can they get out of it? It's not about you. It's about them, right? But at the same time, don't let them steam steamroll you because um, when that happens, you're no longer in a position of power. And when you're negotiating, you always want to be in a position of power. Thanks. Anyone else want to add to that? I can give like a little background on consulting. We kind of have our process a little different. We have um, our clients will submit like a request for proposal and we'll have the various com you know companies. So within consulting, we have typically the big four. We'll all kind of pull together our proposal deck and pitch why you should ultimately pick us instead of the other three competitors. Um, and usually when we win those contracts there, we're always constantly thinking about how we can get additional work. So like with my client, even though we sold this piece of work that I've been working on, I'll be working on through June, I'm always kind of identifying, okay, what's the problem here? And then kind of just going through winning additional services and tacking on, onto our SOW. So it's not, we do have, you know, it's more about the partners going in um, at the director and manager level. We're going and executing that and just going to continue to build out that work. But um, yeah, within the consulting practice, usually our clients come to us with a problem. And we just kind of put together a storyboard as to why you should pick us to serve to serve you. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to answer? You don't have to, but. Sure, I, I can. Um, just like George and Jen, I agree. You should know who you are up against. It's important to know that. And I think a lot of us are fixated on we should win in the negotiation, but I think both parties should be ultimately happy that is a successful outcome of a negotiation. Um, for example, when we represent a buyer and a seller, if the buyer wants to pay 440 for the home, but it's but the seller wants 450, we come to a middle, middle ground. Maybe I would advise the buyer, well, 445 seems like a good number as opposed to you having the opportunity of losing the home because the seller's not happy with you. So I think, well, don't just be fixated on, oh, I win because I'm negotiating and my skills are right on. Think about the other person too, just like George and Jen mentioned. I think it's important to have both parties be happy in the outcome. Hey, Ola, no pressure, but if you'd like to answer, you're good? Okay. Great. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, everyone, for those answers. Um, all right. So is there ever a conflict between your personal values and your career? And if there ever is a conflict, how do you handle that? Um, all right. We're going to go back to the original order. Uh, Nicole? Unless you don't want to go, Nicole, it's okay. Um. I mean, personally, I don't think in my career that there's like a conflict there. There are things that I'm passionate about, um, like, for example, like DEI. Um, and I've brought up maybe if there's a lack of certain things at my company, um, I've made a decision to kind of drive those efforts. So in the last few years, I've been kind of leading that for my practice. Um, so I'm really trying to see if I see any gaps, whether it's like, you know, bridging the equity gap for women, I bring in opportunities there. I have partner events with South Queens Women's March. So I try to put my... Um, you know, try to help and see how I can build that within my company and help the community as well. But um, so far, not, not too concerned, in, at least in my job. Thank you. Rose? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so is there ever a conflict between your personal values and your career? Um, and if there ever is a conflict, how do you handle that conflict? 
so I wouldn't say it's personal values, but there's always a conflict when I sit with a seller and they always want a hundred percent higher in the home price. And I'm there in front of them providing data and facts why your home is worth $50,000 less, but yet still they're like, let's put it on the market. Let's, let's see what happens in the meantime. That is a lot of work and marketing and money and goes into a 30 day, let's see what happens. Now, sometimes because you want the opportunity to sell this home, you sort of have to say, well, okay, how about we put it on the market for 30 days? If there's no offers, we'll revisit that conversation about pricing. But I find that a lot, I have to deal with sellers with overpriced homes and it's not necessarily the way I want to run my business and the core value of my business. But ultimately I sometimes say, okay, and work with the client. And sometimes it may not work out. I would have to walk away after working months for pro bono or sometimes it works out where the seller is motivated and is flexible with the price so it's tough but we somehow make it work thank you uh george uh you should always do the right thing um, but at the same time, you should always do what you need to do to get the job done. And I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Uh, Jen? Um, I think similar to Nicole, I feel like it's been less about personal values conflicting with things and more... Um, in my experience, how can I bring some of my personal values into the workplace um, and make it more diverse and make it better? So again, similarly, I've been in, always involved in lots of DEI initiatives and leading employee resource groups and all of that good stuff, because I think that having a well-rounded workforce is what also helps, again, when you're dealing with different clients and, and you can bring in different perspectives and different expertise and um, that sort of thing has been my experience. Um, I think the only conflict sometimes that comes up is that, as I said, a, a big part of um, my role is upsells and renewals. And so you have quotas to hit and you have numbers and sometimes you don't hit the numbers. And just knowing that you know, having to go to the higher ups and explain why I think where the personal comes into it is they see numbers and I'm like, but this didn't make sense for the client. So I'm not going to pitch them something. Um, and so having to to have a backbone in those situations and, and explain why um, that's where, again, it's, it's a little convoluted and, and a little um, more job related, but I think from a, a like personal value perspective, if something doesn't make sense to me to, to sell to a client, if I don't think, even if it's, that we're trying to push SMS on every single customer. And I don't think that it makes sense. I'm not going to do um, or and I'll find something else <laughs> to sell them or I'll find another way to upsell an existing client with something. Um, so that that's kind of the only piece that I ever personally see a challenge with. Thank you, Ayla. Yeah, so for me, uh, I'm actually the same with Jen and uh, call on um, a full-time job side. On the real estate side, I, I think the one thing that happens is, especially when you are uh, an investor, uh, sometimes, or when, when, when you're new, you want to renovate a property, uh, you know, to the best of your abilities. But a lot of the times, because you want for me, especially when I when I renovate a property, is to give somebody a home, right? So, typically, I I rent out my renovated apartments to Section Eight, uh, just to provide you know housing for them, um, and you know provide you know a better neighborhood for people to live in, you know, uh, and families to go to better schools. But sometimes I'm conflicted between making the property better and then 
hurting my pockets for profits. Uh, a simple example would be like, hey, um, to put in central air, right? So central air is going to cost an additional $10,000 per unit. Uh, but again, it would be very beneficial for this family. Uh, and it would, you know, make their lives really much easier instead of buying an AC and, uh, you know, for each room. So I think that's been the major part, um, the major challenge for me, especially because personally, I want to help individuals and I want to help them get these homes and I want them to be the best possible uh, apartments that they can live in. But also the other side is I have to understand I'm still running a business and I still got to make profits on my end. So that's where the conflict uh, lies with me. Thank you, everyone. Um, so how do you stay motivated and committed to work that often has complex challenges? Um, I'm going to start with Nicole. Um, for me personally, I think I, I found like an area of what I'm actually really passionate about and interested in. Um, and I know that what I do has really big impacts because they're whether government, like they're putting out a new rule, law, regulation, it's going to have impacts to my clients. Um, and being able to help proactively, you know, and really be a part of the strategic like planning of that um, is something for me I'm, I'm really passionate about. I actually really like going in and like making a difference there, um, as well as on the back end where um, I deal with some remediation work. If something did go in trouble and try to help fix that. So I'm seeing like direct impact of my work. So I think that would is what keeps me motivated as well as more of the personal side, how we said in the previous question, being involved with DI um, and the women's network in our group and just really, you know, get like developing the other, like other women and underrepresented groups as they're going through their careers and just seeing um, just their growth too, that keeps me motivated because I've had that people done that for me before my in my career and now I get the opportunity to do that for others. So that's what keeps me going every day. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, could you go ahead, Rose? Sure. I relate with Nicole on this a lot. It is ultimately passion because there are days with real estate, it's so stressful. You just want to give up. It's, it's, it's tough. It's definitely a, a competitive market where there are hundreds of other real estate agents and you're you're fighting for uh, one home and there's a hundred other competing with you, but because of passion, and I know I have that direct impact to help families and it, it, it is the driving force for me to continue to do what I do. And also it offers me a lifestyle that I'm comfortable with the flexibility of the hours. So you are your own boss in real estate. You don't have someone telling you about your hours. However, the more you put in, is the more results you'll get. So a combination of passion, working with families, and just uh, being able to work in my schedule keeps me motivated. Thank you. Uh, Jen? Oh, actually, I skipped George, but you know, Jen, just go ahead and then we'll go back to George. <laughs> I, uh, funnily enough, I kind of have the opposite to say where it's not that I don't love my job and, and everything, but I even tell my clients, I'm like, at the end of the day, we are not saving lives. Someone didn't get a password reset email. Someone didn't get their 10% off coupon. Like no one is, no lives are being lost over this. And I think that that's kind of the thing because being client facing, especially dealing with larger enterprise clients as I do, um, they think that the end of the world happens every single time a platform is down. And, and again, being client facing means that you are the face of the company. So even though I have no control over the engineering work and I have no control over what product decides to work on, um, I am the person that gets the brunt of everything. And so I think just while I, that's a part of the job that I, I like working with different companies and having different clients and different verticals. Um, and strategizing with them, that's the part of it that can get really tough is that the things that you have no control over, you still have to be the the voice. Um, and I just kind of come back to 
it is okay. We are not saving lives. Nothing <laughs> is going wrong. I feel for doctors and I feel for all of that. And But in my role, I'm not doing that. And so I think just keeping that constant reminder in the back of my mind, but then similar to Nicole, like working on other initiatives internally and, and understanding that my my worth to the company is not just tied to a client satisfaction, but also the the other things that I can bring. So are there like projects that I can work on internally to kind of help the entire team be more efficient or get better um, and spreading myself in, in those different ways so that it's not just getting burnt out by something happens and all of the clients are upset and mad for a week <laughs> getting bogged down in that. Thank you. Uh, George? Yeah, so as a as a finance guy, I'm naturally obsessed with numbers and charts. Uh, so some of my biggest motivators is uh, performance metrics and um, operating results, right? So you know, I'll, you know, I always want to see that chart going up. I don't want to see it plateauing. I don't, you know, I I want to see uh, the value of premium sold per month increasing. You know, I want to see the number of properties sold increasing. I want to see the number of mortgages being brokered increasing. Um, and uh, to get through that, you know, I apply parade law quite often where, you know, 80% of, resu of results comes from 20% of your, uh, of your operators. Um, so if if my agents, if my uh, brokers, if my franchisees are having difficulty um, driving those numbers, you know, it's, it's my job to touch base with them, figure out what's going on. How can I help? How can I contribute to their growth uh, and, and succeeding, right? So just like Rose mentioned, like you are your own boss in this kind of industry, um, but sometimes you will need a helping hand. And um, you know, that's where I come in and I, you know, I, we figure out uh, what the problem is. You know, I, I bring those skills and experiences back from the consulting days and, uh, you know, try to get you back on your feet. Thank you. So, so seeing uh, my team around me grow and succeed is, is, is really aspiring and motivating for me. Thank you, George. Uh, Ayola? Yes. Uh, can you just repeat the question for me one more time? Yeah, sure. So um, the question is, how do you stay motivated and committed to your work? Um, which can often be associated with complex challenges, any aspect of your work. Yeah, uh, I, I I think just for me, it's more of understanding why the reason why I'm, I'm in real estate and also how my family and generations and generations to come will benefit off of it. Um, the, and there are times where I, I do want to quit. Um, there were there are times in which you lose a lot of money in a deal. Uh, you, so again, we invest in multiple states, so traveling that's a cost. Uh, but the the one thing that keeps me motivated and grounded is is my family, and uh, and also keeps me hungry to to you know to keep pushing even when. Just like the scenario I said earlier, like the property being vandalized, uh, us going over budget, the contractor stealing money from us, um, and it happens. It happens. It, it, you can predict them, especially when you're going to a whole new uh, state and you're trying to fill out contractors. It just happens. So um, I think for me, what keeps me grounded is knowing what my vision is, knowing what our goal is, and uh, and just to keep pushing. Thank you. All right. Um. So, what skills do you think are the most important for success in your respective fields? I kind of like the idea of just like picking out one skill, you know, the most important skill. But if you can't think of one, that's okay. Um. Just skills that you consider important. All right. Uh. Go ahead, Nicole. I would say problem solving. Number one. Okay. I like that short and sweet and a good takeaway, problem solving. All right, uh, Rose? 
that's exactly what I had in mind. Problem solving. <laughs> I totally agree. Um, effective communication as well and critical thinking. All right, uh, George. Yep, agreed with everything that is said, and I'll throw uh, team collaboration into that. Okay. Jen. Yeah, in my role, communication, 100%, both uh, to clients and internally, and being able to wordsmith things at all times. All right, Ayola? Same thing, communication. Um, I think that's huge, just and people skills, um, being, being able to communicate with different kind of people from all aspects of the world. I liked how rapid fire that was, and I also like that a lot of people agree that's that's always a good sign. All right. Um, so what advice would you give to someone considering a field, oh, sorry, excuse me, considering a career in your field? And I'm going to kind of combine that with an audience question. So also, um, how do you think folks can build confidence? You know, how, how did you build confidence in your field when you were first starting out? So advice to somebody starting out and how did you build confidence in your field? Uh, Nicole? Okay. Um, so, so confidence and what you would do if you're starting in the field. Yeah, advice for somebody starting off and then just also how you can build, how you built confidence and how they can build confidence. Okay, so starting off, um, I would say networking. Um, that's a big part of it. I think, especially like in consulting, and I'm sure across all the board, it's who you know, um, just to even get your foot in the door um, as well. If there's technical skills, if, like for my example, like I got, I did my degree in finance. I got the, you know, the necessary education or certifications that I needed. Um, but it was really to even get the opportunities who I knew, just networking, the person, you know, being personable um, was the biggest, um, I think, step there to just get it through the door. Um, and then confidence for myself was um, honestly just being like, confident that I knew what I was speaking about, especially consulting, they're coming to here, like coming to us for like expertise advice. And if I don't know, or at least can articulate myself, I'm, I'm not going to ever like have that credibility there. So just being sure of myself, knowing that even if I didn't know the answer, I'll be like, you know what, let me go back to you. So, but not really kind of, you know, having that nervousness or whatnot, but I know it takes some time to build that up, but it was really being sure of myself. Um, and that's what kind of, relay that across to my clients that they can trust me even if I didn't know right away I would come back and find the answer for them thank you Rose yes I totally agree with Nicole um, so I'm going to tie in real estate being a radio host and being an MC, knowing your content give you that confidence so for example, back to real estate, if I'm going to sit with a homeowner and I'm unsure of what I'm going to say, I am going to feel nervous. But if I'm confident in the work that I will be producing, I will feel invincible. Sometimes that will take years to build up. So it's okay, as Nicole mentioned, to have sort of a default answer. I'm not sure of the answer, but I will get back to you. Obviously, you're not going to say that for every question they're asking, because then you're going to look like you're not, you don't know what you're doing. But confidence comes with being prepared and how you're prepared is knowledge. Now, in terms of advice for someone starting off in real estate, I would say, please don't believe what you see on million dollar listing and HGTV, we're not just walking into our house, showing them three houses and making $300,000. That's not how it works. I wish that's how it works. Sometimes it takes months and then uh, the commission is not like LA and New York city. It's different. Three, three most important things I would say is have reserves in the bank because you're not sure when you will be earning an income. So have some reserves in the bank at least six months. Get a real estate coach, invest in a real estate coach, because the knowledge they're going to impart on you will help you to create more business. And number three, network, network, network. And that would be my advice to new uh, agents getting into the business. Thank you, George. Yep, so it's a two-pronged question. I'll start off answering the first one, which is um, how can you get started in a particular field, right? Um, 
you know, if if you want to go into, into, into any field or do anything and you're in a room, I, I, I think you should be the dumbest person in the room, right? You want to be surrounded by people that know more and greater knowledge about the field that you're seeking to enter. If you're the smartest person in that room, then you probably, you probably, you're probably not in the right room. Um, and as for the confidence building part, I'm going to share a little bit about myself. Um, I stand in front of the mirror and I practice what I'm going to say. And I like, I fix my suits and I, you know, like, like, like I'm, I'm, my hand gestures, my body language, um, my facial expressions. Um, and in the mirror, I'm trying to picture everyone in their underwear. Um, just, just free flowing it, you know, what am I going to say? Cause you don't want to sound too robotic. Right. Um, and and doing that will slowly build that confidence. And eventually you can kind of just get out there and, you know, say what you got to say. Thank you. Um, I always heard about the underwear trick, but I've never used it. But maybe maybe I will now. Um, <laughs> all right, Jen. Yeah, um, I think for getting into my field again, because it's kind of a newer one, it's one that people don't really know about. So it's just starting. Um, there are, I think that networking is obviously the biggest thing in life. There are lots of, um, events and there are a lot of like customer success meetups and, and things that go on in the city. So I feel like that's the, the best part because again, people, and just hearing from others, talking to others who are in that role and understanding both the, the pros and the cons of it, um, knowing what you're getting yourself into and knowing that you need to be a very fluid person and someone who can take no's and, and again, kind of be okay being the, um, the face of the company, but also again, the good parts are like, you get to work with all of these different giant companies that, that you hear about and you get to actually have a hand in the emails that they send out to their millions of customers. Um, in terms of confidence, I think one thing that I was really bad at and still am not 100% good at is just asking for help. Um, I think that we, like women, especially minorities, especially, like we feel like we need to know everything right off the bat. Um, and we feel like we need to work 10, 10, we do need to work 10 times harder, 20 times harder a lot of the time. But being in similarly like surrounding yourself with those people as Rose mentioned but also being okay with asking for help and recording yourself speaking and and knowing what filler words you you use and and listening to other people's conversations sometimes or just asking to be a fly on the wall so I did that um with when I was starting in my my current role because I had done this for eight years prior uh I just asked to join calls and I said, so that I can hear how other people are positioning things and how they're wording things and saying things and then using some of that and then bringing my own version um, and flavor of things into it. But I think that asking for help is probably the biggest thing and something that a lot of us are not very good at because we feel like we need to know everything right off the bat. Um, but the way that the people that know all the things started is exactly how we did without knowing it. Um, so again, shadowing calls, listening to things, um, I feel like that's the way to build the confidence. And then again, as Rose mentioned, just doing your homework, um, twice a year, I have in-person meetings with my clients and the executives there. And it's always my goal to tell them one thing about their company that they don't even know. Um, because I feel like that lets them know that I'm a partner. I'm not just a vendor. I'm not just here um, to, to sell you things about my company and, and make you do all of the things. But like, I know this weird fact that was in your earnings report last quarter or something like that. Um, or I know that you're all working on an acquisition, or I, I know that you're releasing something new for fall. Um, something like that makes people know that, um, that you've done your homework. And, and again, it just leads to that, that credibility and confidence because after that, they're gonna listen to everything that you have to say. Ayla? Yeah, for me, um, I was just saying, find a mentor in real estate. Um, and as you go through the process, you're, you're gain more confidence and know that it's easier to buy real estate than you actually 
believe, um, know the difference between a conventional and FHA loan. Um, right now, instead of putting 20% down, you could put 1%. Um, there's, there's a lot of programs like Zillow, Rocket Mortgage. There's companies put in that allows you to put $1,000 down and they cover the the closing costs for you. There's so many programs. Other comp other states will actually pay for you to move in. I know Jersey, they pay up to $21,000 assistant down payment program for you to move in and come live in Jersey. So just doing your research. Um, and once you have the first one, keep educating yourself, talk to your mentor, uh, and then continue to grow your, your portfolio. So, but just continue doing your research in real estate. Even if you think the prices are too high, too expensive, there's always a way, you know, there's always a way. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, just because we're actually running short on time um, and everybody's import imparted so much wisdom and I have been really impressed with everybody's answers and I think it's been super helpful. Um, but I'm going to probably skip past a few of the questions, just, you know, just, um, to honor and value everyone's time, but anybody who is here, either watching on Facebook or you know um, on this Zoom meeting, please um, put any questions you really you know anything you really want to know. Um, please ask it in the chat um, because you know I want to be cognizant and value everyone's time. So I don't want to go um, past eight really, um, or much past eight, more than a couple of minutes past eight. Um, all right, so yeah, please let me know if you have any burning questions. So I think you've all discussed this a little bit, but I've just heard so much about the importance of networking and relationships. So does anybody sort of just want to talk a little bit more about the importance of networking and relationships and advancing in your field? And I think for the last few questions, we're going to switch up the order. Uh, so please go ahead, Aola. Yeah, um, I can jump in especially in real estate uh, investing locally or investing out of state you need a pool of people you can trust so that's where your network comes in um you need a, the network to find the right pool of people sometimes it's going to take some trial and errors but connecting with people other investors connecting uh, joining real estate groups on facebook you'll be surprised how many real estate groups are there for each different state connecting, meeting different people, uh, and learning from their mistakes as well. That's, I, I think that's what is going to help you a lot, especially as you build your portfolio. Um, and those, and those networks, you can even eventually end up doing deals together uh, that happen for us. So, uh, keep in contact with them, join different groups, uh, RE groups that you can, and just build your network as much as you can. Thank you. Uh, Jen? Uh, I think the biggest thing that I have learned too is that networking doesn't need to mean rubbing elbows with higher ups and, and executives. Uh, my At my first company, I made a really good group of friends who we have gone to each other's weddings and we have done lots of things and we stay at each other's houses and we have brunch all the time but every new job that I have had or any time that that one of us is looking for a new job or has a career question or is going through anything we lean on each other for that part and so I think again when people hear networking I feel like a lot of the times we think that you have to go to this conference and be all buttoned up and and talk to these people that are higher up than you. But like even South Queens Women's March, we have so many people with such diverse backgrounds and and so many um, different career paths who might know someone. So I think you're it's it's really important to understand that your friends can be your network and your network can become your friends. Um, and it doesn't all have to be professional, but it has to be people that you can trust and that you can lean on. Um, and, and again, you can, you can have both, which I think is not a thing that, that people think about a lot when you think about networking. Thank you. And yeah, that was really helpful. Um, cause that isn't what I think of when I think of networking, but you're right. That is definitely a big part of it. Uh, George. 
Uh, so I'll speak a, a little bit on the networking powwows that Jen does not seem to be a big fan of. Um, uh, so, you know, oftentimes people get suited up and they go to these big conferences and these big seminars and conventions. And the whole point of going there is to network and meet people, right? But it's like, oh, how do I exactly go up to that person and introduce myself and give them my elevated pitch, right? Like when they're in the middle of, you know, talking to someone else where they're, you know, on their laptop typing an email, like, what do you do, Right go to the bar, right? But don't try to strike up a conversation with someone that's at the bar waiting to get their drink. Get your drink, because people go typically go and get your, their drinks alone, right? Go get your drink and go stand by the door or stand by an entry area or stand by the doorway that leads back into the convention or whatever. And when someone gets the drink, it's 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 the first couple seconds of... of, of of when you get your drink, it's kind of awkward, right? Like, what do, what, what do I do? Like, if I stay in here, do I go over there? Do I drink my drink, right? So when you see that, right, that's a perfect opportunity time to approach them, right? Like, hey, cheers, like, what are you in town for? What are you here to do, right? It's, it's such a simple way to strike up a conversation and you never know who you're gonna meet, right? Um, another way to kind of pick and choose who you're gonna speak to, right? Like, if someone's ordering, like, a and again, nothing wrong with cranberry vodka, right? But if someone's ordering that, right, they're probably not very senior, right? But like, if someone is going to get the McAllen 18, like, all right, like that problem, that person's probably pretty seasoned, right? So, you know, look for these little clues, be in a strategic position, maximize your time, right? Don't stand there for half an hour trying to pick out who you, to talk to, because if you don't get started on doing something, you're never gonna get started. So go out there, have fun, enjoy networking. Rose. Wow, thanks for sharing your secret. And by the way, I want to stay in touch with everyone. Everyone is so wonderful. I'm having such a great time. Um, <laughs> well, when it comes to networking, I think it's a uh, very important for advancing in your career. And sometimes it's not what you know, but it's who you know in, in today's world. So stay in touch with that person or people, but in an authentic way, because sometimes people people could see through your uh, goals. And if you do it in your truest ways, and the director at QCC, Antonio, taught me something, it's called reciprocity. So don't only expect to get, but also give. And I think when you come from a place of value, people will remember, you will stay on top of mind. In real estate, we always want to be top of mind. And that one person may be able to be instrumental in your career pro progression. So I would say stay authentic, keep in touch in an authentic way and reciprocity. And build networking, keep talking. Sometimes someone may not want to talk to you. That's fine. Move on to the next person. Just, just talk to as many people as you can. Nicole? Oh, everyone had amazing things to say. I could just piggyback on that. Um, just a point from like Jen and then George. Um, with Jen, just how like my connections that I've made, even just like you said, personal as well. I just thought of like with Iola, he, we worked together years ago and still is a great friend, a person I go to about with real estate advice, financial advice, involvement in different community and organizations. You honestly never know who you'll meet and how you can help each other. And as well as with the more corporate or the networking events, um, something that has really helped me, I find um, organizations that I personally am in, like have a, a passion or belief in. So whether it's community-based, um, I'm part of like New York Urban League, um, you know, South Queens Women's March. Um, I have a, one of actually an organization I was in college and now we have a collegiate group here. And just finding ways that, you know, some commonality there, if you're really passionate about, you know, saving the world for like oceans, you know, and then everyone kind of has that like agreement there and you can see how you can get involved in the community aspect, but how you can help each other in your business world too. So just finding common ground with people um, and just building and being authentic in it because it could start off being friendly and then, you know, maybe in a couple of years, they happen to be at a company that you're looking for and you're like, hey, just give me a resume. I'll get you a job. I know I've done that with some of my friends and I know in the future that will come. So you just never know. So be authentic and don't look at it as transactional as a relationship that you'll develop over the years. All right, this actually segues perfectly into the next question. So thank you so much, Nicole. But uh, what resources or organizations, if you know of any, do you recommend for individuals seeking to enter or advance in your field? Um, Ayala? 
I will recommend um I'll recommend books. Uh and I think well first a mentor, right? And then two um uh, books on the type of real estate you're trying to get into. So if that's single family, multifamily, um commercial. Uh, it, there's a book I would recommend is by uh, Bigger Pockets podcast. It's called The Multifamily Millionaire. Um, that's mostly about multifamily. Um, but I would definitely start with what your passion is, what you're trying to invest. You know what type of properties you're trying to you know acquire, and also build your network, just like how we would say, right? So when it's time to actually invest, you know, you know. The lawyers you go to, you know, you probably go to Rose, right? And you go to George for insurance. Um, so you like you build the whole uh, network for you know for everyone, and and now is a smooth and easy process. So that's what I recommend. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. I am not fully opposed to the traditional networking, George. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I do recommend, there are in customer success, again, because it's it's a little bit of like the startup technology culture, um, which tends to skew a little younger. Um, but there are a bunch of like Slack groups that you can join. There's women in customer success. There's um meetups are are really big so people will just post in meetup um or there are forums on reddit there's all sorts of kind of information out there i think in on the internet because it's it the industry tends to skew a little younger um so there are just lots of resources at your fingertips but i think even being in customer success one of the biggest things that has helped me again because it is a client facing role is also joining and and being on newsletters and being a part of different verticals so retail for example um i'm in the national retail federation and i get all of their newsletters and um just signing up for for all of those type of things so to to what a lot of us had spoken about before just keep learning and and keep keep up to date with what's going on in different industries um i think that there's there's so much information out there with the internet right now that it's it, it's hard to not be involved <laughs> it's hard to not have information at your fingertips George? um so two things uh you know, I, again, I am a trial by fire kind of guy. So, it's, it's especially if you're young, it's why don't, why don't you go ahead and just try it out, right? Like, if you want to do real estate, if you want to do insurance, if you want to do mortgages, right? Go ahead and try it out. Um, but you know, as you get older, and it seems like all of us on the panel here are somewhat involved in sales. Uh, back to Jen's point, there is a lot of resources out there, but I think. Albeit that there is a lot of resources, I think the important part of that is being able to connect all the dots, right? So I am a big reader of the Wall Street Journal. So I read every morning, read every night, um, and and it'll tell it'll tell you about you know the jolt report, and the labor market report, and inflation, and CPI, and PPI, and all these crazy different numbers, right? And individually, you know, it's it's not going to mean much, right? Great, we know inflation is going up three point three percent. That doesn't help you. Right. But it's about connecting the dots. Right. For example, we, um, I, I think three of us here, including myself, I have an active uh, real estate license. Uh, we practice real estate. So part of that is the Federal Reserve's Fed fund rate increases. Right. Part of that is, is, is core CPI. Part of it is, you know, the economy. How can we all connect that together? I think understanding how the world works and how the world revolves and how uh, you know, cash flow works. I think that's extremely important in getting off to a good start. Rose? Yeah, I agree with George. Just constantly learning every single day and being able to read the Wall Street Journal, educating yourself of what's happening. So, for example, there is this um, website called Keep in Current Matters. 
and they are a national company that provides real estate trends. And it's a great way to keep up with what's happening because every day the real estate market changes. So just to be aware of what's happening, it, it, it again, gives you the confidence to go out there and just produce the proper way. And like Iolas mentioned, having a mentor. So your resource should be a platform where you're getting market trends, continuous learning, also getting mentorship. And as I will mention as well, if, for example, you feel like your negotiation skills is not up to par, get a book. If you don't like to read, there's Audible. They'll read the book for you, but constantly learning, it will help you with uh, success, long-term success. So those resources should be mandatory, reading every day and subscribing to platforms that will provide you with those uh, education. Nicole? Yeah, just to echo everyone else, likewise, and just reading like myself, um, I've joined like, we have the um, Certified Fraud Examiners Association where I get my like cost of literature, just keeping up to date what's going on, especially in like my industry, um, and as well as joining organizations that you will network with people who are where you want to be. Like George said previously, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. So I'm a part of a lot of organizations here in the city where I'm learning from women who are well ahead of me, who are like, see, like you know, chief risk officers and execs at banks, and I'm kind of just getting advice and learning about how their journey was and just things that I should know. So just always being around someone who you could look forward to, like. If there's someone in your life that you you really want to learn from what's something that they're doing, just partner yourself with that. Well, you want to set up like coffee chats with them, just staying connected. But um, I always try to keep myself around people I can learn something from and as well add value in any way too. obviously having a symbiotic relationship. But um, just, you know, constantly just picking brains and just learning more about what you want to get involved in. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, we're out of time, but I think I just want to end it and you could just make it a sentence or two. Um, about what are your future career aspirations or goals? I'm sure that could be a very, very long answer, but since we're out of time, just, you know, you know, the, the short version of it. Uh, Aola? Yeah, for me, it would be to generate at least 150K in monthly revenue for my business. So. Okay, it's a great goal. Um. <laughs> Jen? Yeah, uh, mine is to manage a team of customer success managers. That's kind of, um, you know, being an individual contributor is great, but kind of what Nicole alluded to, it's it's really nice. I've managed one, two people in the past and just seeing what you were able to get from someone else and being able to pass that on to other people, I think is, is really rewarding. Thank you. George? Yeah, so, uh, you know, short-term girl, uh, grow, uh, goal, um, I think after our recent acquisition, Clarity Insurance has about 56 offices nationwide. Um, so ideally, you know, by, by end of the year, by end of, uh, by end of the year, next year, you know, we want to have about 100 offices uh, operating uh, nationwide in about 48 states, excluding New York, because yeah. New York's awful for, you know, those that practice real estate would know. Um, and and just kind of you know keep growing the business, keep managing it, and just helping you know my agents and my franchisees continually succeed. Thank you, Rose. Yeah, just when people think about real estate, Rose comes to mind, and also to multiply the amount of families I sell homes to, and just keep growing, as George mentioned. Okay, and we'll finish it off with you, Nicole. Yep, just continue to grow, um, move up from director, partner, and then work. With, I'm actually working with Iowa to get my real estate investing off mm -hmm. the ground. So trying to get some of my side hustles on, on that as well as consulting, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you to the panelists um, for participating and for all the great advice you gave. And thank you as well for everybody who attended, to everybody who attended. Um, I'll see some of you tomorrow. Um, thank you all so much and have a great night. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.